Good evening and uh, welcome to Behind Headlines. Uh, today is Wednesday the 21st of July 2021 and in this programme today we are going to be talking about Tis the Av or known as the 9th of Av and uh, this is an historic a day in the Jewish calendar where the Jewish people mourned the destruction of the first and the second temples. But this day has a huge biblical significance, it has a huge historical significance and also future significance as we've seen that the worst atrocities that have fallen the Jewish people have actually occurred on the 9th of Av. So on this very hot day, we will be un unpacking this very hot issue. Uh, Reagan, uh, it's great to be doing this program with you on Behind the Lines again. Always good to be here, Simon. Uh, real privilege, and like you say, it's, it's an incredibly important topic that we're dealing with. Um, cataclysmic events throughout history have seen on um, Tish B'Av, the 9th of Av, um, so many tragedies before the Jewish people and it's important that we discuss uh, this little discussed in Christian circles topic. Uh, this day we're talking about the 9th of Av occurred mm. on Sunday so as the Jewish people finish Shabbat on uh, on Saturday night uh, entered then into uh, the 9th of Av which is very very significant. I mean it's a very somber day uh, it's an extremely somber day actually for the Jewish people as they, they remember the destruction of the first and the second temples. So, mm. um, and you consider all these are major events that have occurred. Uh, I'm just going to list a few of them, and we'll go into a lot more detail as we go through the program. Uh, these uh, include the Jewish people being uh, expelled from England in 1290, it happened on the 9th of Av, uh, the Spanish Inquisition in uh, 1490, and then together with the expulsion of the Jewish people from Spain in 1492. Uh, we see the Russian programs against the Jewish people. The First World War started on the 1st of Av. And uh, also we see that the final solution was implemented, the very start of it, on the 9th of Av. And uh, we also have some uh, current up-to-date examples, um, Israel's war against uh, uh, Hez Hezbollah yeah, in, yeah. in southern Lebanon in 2006 was also on the 9th of Av. Uh, and also we see also that uh, in 1942, the Nazi death camp of Treblinka became operational uh, and the Jewish people were cleared from the Warsaw Ghetto on the 9th of Av. So it, the 9th of Av is a particular date, I think, that must put fear into the hearts of the Jewish people. But it's also a day that Satan uh, has as his day to actually attack the Jewish people. And, and what we really see ever since the destruction of the first and the second temple is that there were, there's almost a mirror reflection of what happened in AD 70. The, the Jewish people were, were murdered by mm. the Romans. They were expelled and forced to flee their land. And again, so many cases throughout history over the last 2,000 years, we've actually seen this in place. And the, the effects of that cataclysmic day there in AD 70, um, when the Emperor Titus goes in, I mean, yeah, the, the events commemorated in the Arch of Titus there in Rome, and it depicts uh, the Jews being hauled off in chains. Uh, it depicts the uh, desecration of the temple, the menorah being carried off as a, um, re really a symbol of uh, victory and just the complete denigration of um, the Jews and their, their faith. Um, that also has had effects that have rippled throughout time since because that's where we see this mass diaspora of the Jews across the world um, where you know we have so many now who are outside of Israel and um, it's it's all key it's all part of um, God working his perfect plan and purpose albeit undeniably um, tragic. If you look at um, various Jewish sites, um, uh, um, Chabad and other groups, they r look at this and they say this is almost as if God has set this one day aside for his people to mourn. And I think it serves as a somber reminder, really, you know, this, the people fast, they they're to abstain from um, food, they're to abstain from marital relations, they're to, um, to, to 
live in a very somber way. They can't, they can't sit on a normal chair like we're sitting in. They have to sit closer um, to the floor. Um, it's a reminder of the pain and sorrow of the destruction of the temples, but also so many of these other events that we're going to be um, talking about, as well as um, it, it, in the course of the observance of the day, in many traditions, they will cleanse the floor. They will wash the floor um, a, as a symbol of, of coming hope and the awaited redemption um, that will come with the Messiah. Um, so very, very crucial. And even, even uh, Yeshua uh, himself actually discusses the ninth of Av. And you're thinking, mm. where is this in the Bible? Well, you turn to Matthew 24. Uh, it says, uh, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to, the, to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them and said, you see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be one left here on one stone upon another that will not be thrown down, as clear yeah. reference to the destruction of the second temple in AD 70, which fell on the 9th of Av. I think also, uh, you know, according to my notes here, that the, the first time we really see um, the 9th of Av um, come into fruition uh, is with the biblical story of the 12 spies, when Moses sends out the 12 spies, mm -hmm. uh, including our, our heroes um, Joshua and Caleb, um, to spy out the land of Canaan, and uh, 10 of them come back with a, a bad report, and that fell on the 9th of Av. Yeah, so 1313 BC, um, the um, people have come out of Egypt. They've seen God's glory. They've seen how he has uh, completely toppled the Egyptian gods, each of the plagues corresponding to an assault on those gods. They've seen God's power, and then they get to the promised land, the, the spies go in, and you, you have 12 spies, two, Joshua and Caleb, they come back and say, yes, let's take it. God has given it into our hands. And then you have these guys who are milling about over here. They're saying, yeah, it's beautiful, it's great. Fly with mil Fly with milk and honey. And honey. Uh, imagine those grapes, the, the vines that had to be carried by um, two men. Uh, just y y you're picturing this. Which is the logo of the Israeli Ministry of Tourism. It, it is, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's great. Uh, uh, but you're picturing this lush scene. And they say, yeah, but the inhabitants are quite scary. They're like giants and we're to them like grasshoppers. And, um, you know, then it, get, it gets worse. It's not just that they lack faith in and their ability to defeat, they lack faith in God. It's like basically God has brought us out here to die. And they start accusing Moses and they start accusing God and they start bemoaning that they left slavery in Egypt. Um, and so we see from that point, they're consigned to wander in the wilderness for 40 years um, until Joshua and also Caleb are able to um, take the people into the promised land. Absolutely. So just to remind you, we are live, we are interactive tonight. So I'd love to know your views and your opinions. So the big question for tonight's programme is, does the 9th of Av fit into a Bible prophecy? And what are your thoughts on the 9th of Av? And uh, please feel free to email us or text in if you've never heard of the 9th of Av before, because I pretty much guarantee you won't hear this being taught in our churches, which is a major tragedy. We fast forward. Um, after the conquering of um, Canaan, uh, we get to uh, a really grim period. I'm, I'm sure the ninth of Av had um, other um, s sad moments that occurred throughout, say, the Book of Judges or something. But um, we we get to Solomon. Solomon, um, you know, builds this amazing temple. It's incredible. It's beautiful. But unfortunately, while there's um, worship of the one true God sporadically through um, Israel's history, there are good kings and there are bad kings. Um, there are so many bad kings and the people are seduced by f false gods and uh, they practice things that are against God's commands. And so uh, we see that God sends the people into exile. He allows them to be conquered um, by the Babylonians, um, Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar II attacks and besieges Jerusalem. 100,000 Jews are estimated to have died 
in that siege. And they're taken off, they're carried away. That occurred, the destruction of the second temple occurred when? The ninth of Ab. Yeah. yeah, that's incredible. It's incredible. Um, but also, if we consider this one as well, it, it is the fact that uh, we know that uh, those Jewish people that were taken captive uh, by Nebuchadnezzar and uh, the uh, Babylonians were in exile for 70 years until the temple was uh, rebuilt. Um, and then it was only a 400-year period between the first temple, uh, destruction of the first temple in AD 70, then followed by the... Um, the ransacking by the Romans of the Second Temple in AD 70. But the difference was that the destruction of the Second Temple in AD 70 uh, led to the expulsion of the Jewish people to, throughout the four corners of the world. It also then um, had a major impact on, on ripping out or the Jewish roots of our Christian faith and uh, also led the Jewish people then to take up rabbinical uh, Judaism rather than being able to carry on the kind of sacrificial temple worship that they were accustomed to when they're in the land. So it had to fundamentally change. Mm. And uh, we see then that this is when all these major events uh, occurred. But one of the key things to actually take into account when it comes to the ninth of Av and the destruction of the first and second temple, what it proves beyond a shadow of doubt through history is that where the Palestinians or the Arabs or UNESCO claims that the Jewish people have no connection to Jerusalem and the land of Israel, well, this just absolutely destroys it. Mm. So let's have a look now at this uh, CBN report that uh, uncovers incredible archaeological discoveries on the Temple Mount and in Jerusalem, where we saw the destruction of the Second Temple. And this is Chris Mitchell. Year old road next to the city of David. The road leads from the Pool of Siloam below and goes up to the Temple Mount. 2,000 years ago, this likely would have been the route that Jesus took on his way up to the Temple. This is probably where Jesus acted in March, uh, in March uh, during his time. Moran Hajbi is an archaeologist with the Israel Antiquities Authority. We know today that this street was paved during the time of Pontius Pilate, which famous for crucifying Jesus. And now it's opening a new uh, era in the research of Jerusalem. The excavation points directly to the time the Romans quelled a Jewish rebellion and destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. One example is this remarkably preserved 2,000-year-old burned palm frond or branch. When we're speaking about the destruction, this is a destruction. The palm tree was burned in the, in the fire that the Roman uh, ignited here. And again, when we're speaking about the last moment of Jerusalem, this tree probably saw the last moment of Jerusalem. And again, it's very symbolic because this, the palm tree is the symbol of Judea in that time. They also discovered weapons of war from Jerusalem's fight for life. This is the evidence of the battle. These ballista balls that was shot by catapults into the city, maybe within the city itself, arrowheads that was fired both by the Romans and the Jewish rebels. And obviously we're speaking about battles and wars and we have the weapons here that again telling us these stories. Some escaped through this drainage channel. For Hajbi, the project tells a compelling story. And the fighting was happening here in the street and in the drainage channel which is right underneath us. People were just running away through these drainage channels. Some of them ran to Masada. Sometimes I, I find myself imagine people running along the street, maybe running from the Romans, maybe running to fight against the Romans, and again, and this fire in this background. Within a few years, as the dig moves toward the Temple Mount, people can look forward to retracing the steps of Jesus from 2,000 years ago. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the City of David, Jerusalem. Uh, I, I have to say, if you ever get the opportunity to go to Jerusalem, the old city of David is an absolute must. It's uh, incredible. Every time I've gone, there's something new. So, Simon, um, after this exile, 70 years, they return under um, the Emperor Cyrus, who's prophesied by name long before he, he actually came to, to rule in the prophecy of Isaiah. Um, we see Nehemiah, uh, Ezra, Haggai, 
Um, th these are, are all men that we recognize their names from the Old Testament who find their place at the time of the second temple's building. Um, so this would have been about 349 BC. The Jewish exiles return um, by royal decree of Cyrus the Great, who is declared, um, the Lord declares him in Isaiah to be his shepherd, even though he doesn't know the one true God. He is the shepherd of his people. He's been selected for this purpose to send them back. And so um, they go back, they build the temple. And um, while, you know, th there were difficulties, they, they overcome those difficulties. Viewers, please read Nehemiah. Please read um, the story of how that um, that foundation was laid there in Ezra and the uh, procrastination of the people that Haggai addresses. And Obadiah as well. Absolutely. Um, Malachi um, addresses shortly thereafter, uh, this last book in the Old Testament, it addresses some of the um, besetting sin issues um, that the people had in their worship. But one thing that we see, um, really, Simon, with that exile is um, it, it kicked most of the idolatry out. The, we don't see the prevalence of idolatry in Israel um, again until after, um, a, a, after the incarnation. Um, so at, at this point, there's, there's struggles. We have the Hasmoneans. We have um, the, the stories of the, the Maccabees. Oh, yeah, amazing story about the Maccabees. Just incredible stuff goes on. And, and, and the temple is right there, the second temple. But it's not there anymore, is it? No, it's not. There's a big mosque in its, in its way. So we obviously know that uh, this led to the destruction of Jerusalem. It's also believed also by historians that over 2 million uh, Jewish people uh, perished at the siege of Jerusalem in AD 70 that led to destruction, not only of Jerusalem, but also of the second temple that occurred on the, uh, on the 9th of Av. Yeah, um, one of the things that uh, occurred following that is then um, one million Jews are forced into exile. One million Jews are forced into exile across the Roman Empire, um, and that's led, of course, to today's diaspora. But um, 80,000, between 80,000 and um, 100,000 Jews were actually enslaved. So we're not talking about having to go as refugees and finding a nice new life. Many of these people were enslaved. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the, the Arch of Titus shows them being led off in chains in um, a humiliating fashion. This destruction of the Second Temple changed the world as the Jewish people were forced into this exile. They were scattered to the four corners of the earth. And, and, and we can make the case that um, in, in many ways, uh, what we see, the promise God made to Abraham uh, was that I'm going to show you a land, I'm going to give you descendants, they'll be as numerous as the stars in the sky, um, I, I'm going to give you um, blessing, and through you will all the nations of the world be blessed. And of course, that fulfillment of that blessing comes through Jesus Christ. And yet, at, um, at the same time, while um, Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of that blessing, um, it is inarguable that God has used the Jewish people to be a blessing in so many ways um, to the whole world as, um, as we await the return from this current long-term exile um, of the remnant of the Jews to Israel. But what, if, you, if we turn to uh, Leviticus uh, chapter 26, verse 14, it says, But if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, if you will not spurn my statutes, and if your soul abhors my rules, so that you will not do all my commandments, but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will visit you with panic, with wasting disease and fever that will consume the eyes and make the heart ache, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemy shall eat it. I will set my face against you, and you shall be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you shall rule over you, and you shall be free, uh, flee when uh, uh, no one pursues you. So effectively says that, you know, here's the, uh, an agreement with the Jewish people that they can stay in the land, but if they go and serve other gods like they did during the destruction of the first temple, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, the likes of Baal worship, the sacrifice of, of children, 
um, the idolatry, the immorality, then God would kick them out of the land. Uh, and we saw that with the destruction of the first temple. So uh, it's, it's very interesting as well when we look back and, and probably see that the destruction of the second temple in AD 70 was probably one of the most significant moments in world history that has had such huge catastrophic events which all occurred on the 9th of Av. And if we kind of bring this up to the into the Jewish diaspora after AD 70, we also see, for example, I think you've got one about the uh, Bar Kokhva uh, re uh, rebellion, which also the Romans crushed, which happened on the 9th of Av. That, that's right. So um, in 133 um, AD, we, we see that there's um, a revolution. Um, that there's a lot of background viewers um, look up Simon Bar Kokhba um, and I wasn't named after him, by the way. Uh, you were not. You were not. Okay, well, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm glad to hear it because Simon was a false messiah. He, he was a false messiah, and um, he was he was actually paraded um, um, around um, on a, a donkey as well. There were attempts to force prophecies um, to where where he fulfilled them, and then ultimately he's defeated tragically, um, a crushing of. Um, a revolt against the Romans in 133. There's a, a, a slaughtering in Bitar. Um, a, a, it's actually some say it's a butchery, basically, um, of the Jewish rebels there in 133. A year later, the Romans complete. They plow up the Temple Mount, and uh, Jerusalem essentially becomes um, a, a pagan city. You can um, re read about. On this um, this big event, um, just a few sketchy details in 134 in the Megala Taanit, um, which is um, a, a Jewish record of key events. Um, but it, it, one of the things about um, this guy Simon being a false messiah in the prophets in the Old Testament, in Daniel chapter nine, the Messiah as declared, it says that uh, the anointed one will come and he has to be cut off before the destruction of the second temple, before the, the destruction of the temple um, that God is going to reestablish. Also in Haggai, the promise is despite um, Ezra and his contemporaries recording some people being a bit upset that the glory of the temple is not as great as Solomon's and it's not as massive and it's not as aesthetically pleasing. Um, God promises through Haggai the prophet, the glory of this temple will be greater than the first. My glory will enter it. And um, what's in view there is the coming of the Messiah. So, when the, the temple is destroyed, when the second temple is destroyed, that indicates that the Messiah had to have come in fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy there in chapter 9 and also in fulfillment of Haggai's Absolutely. prophecy. But I think we also have to get in our, our mind and our concept that the, the first and second temple held the, the Holy of Holies, which was where the presence of God was, and the high priest, the uh, ha Cohen Hakadal could only go into the Holy of Holies once a year on Yom Kippur. So this is where God's presence was. This is where uh, David wanted to build a, a, a home for for God, as it were, instead of being moved on temples. And that's why it's so significant, um, because that is where the God of Israel resided in the Holy of Holies during that time. Uh, but also, if we move through the Jewish diaspora, for example, into the Middle Ages, uh, we saw that in uh, 1095. Uh, the First Crusade was declared by Pope Urban II, and uh, 10,000 uh, Jewish people were killed, mainly in France and Germany, as the uh, Crusaders went on their so-called Holy Crusade to cleanse the uh, Holy Land and Jerusalem of the, uh, of, of the Muslim rule, and of, uh, particularly from uh, Saladin's forces, uh, which they brought death and destruction. I mean, there are even talks of when the Crusaders entered into the old city of Jerusalem, um, there was such a massacre that apparently you could walk the streets of Jerusalem and it would be knee deep in blood because of the carnage that went on. So they killed Muslims, they killed Christians, uh, they killed Jews, they killed effectively anyone they wanted during the, during the absolute massacre. And all of this fell on, on the 9th of Av. And uh, you know, if we look at our history, our shameful history, mm. uh, that uh, we saw 
that the, that uh, what happened on the 9th of Av uh, in 1190, that the Jews of York were massacred. And then 100 years later on Tisha B'Av, the Jews of England were expelled from these lands and didn't actually return until Oliver Cromwell in the 1560s. Um, so we see that these, these events have a huge impact on the nations, particularly when you think, if we go to Genesis 12, uh, 1 to 3, I will bless those who bless you mm. and I will curse those who curse you. So all these nations that have expelled the Jewish people, I've treated them harshly, it's brought absolute curses upon our nation. Yeah, no, it definitely has. We have some um, emails here. Um, can I, you say, please forgive my ignorance, but I've never heard of it. Could you please enlighten me? I hope um, that you're being enlightened. Thank you um, for thinking it's a great program. Uh, we also have um, that God will not be mocked. The ninth of Av shows God is sovereign. How God deals in, is, is in Israel, how God deals with Israel, he will deal with the world. Are the floods in Germany and China a call to repentance? Um, God bless. I, th I think all of these circumstances that we see, you quoted Matthew chapter 24. Um, there's other passages where um, Jesus notes uh, specific tragedies that have gone on or that will go on. And, and the, the question is to, <laughs> to ask, well, have we repented? Are, are we right um, with God? And to call others to repentance in the light of these. Anita says, evening, Simon and Reagan. It's lovely to see you both. This is the day that spells doom for the Jewish people. So many terrible events have taken place on this day, not least the destruction of the first and second temples and persecution in Europe over the centuries. I remember hearing about this date, but I studied history in RE at, at university. As I recall, the first crusade was being planned around this time. Um, last night, there was a copper colored moon here, biblical blood moon perhaps. Most of us see the signs that point towards the fulfillment of Revelation, perhaps the final event may occur on this date. Should I weep in the fifth month, which is I've separating myself as I have done these so many years? Zechariah 7 verse 3 says, blessings, Anita. Well, we've got an interview coming up. Before we do, I'm just going to rattle through some of the other major events that occurred during the Middle Ages that have huge significance for the nations, also the Jewish people. So in July of 1290, we have the general expulsion of the Jews were ordered by uh, King Edward I. Uh, he made it clear by the 1st of November that all Jews had to leave the country or face execution. The Hebrew date which this edict was announced was Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av, and about 2,000 Jews were exiled from England, while less than 100 converted to Christianity. Um, we also see that the Tower of London um, served as the main point of exit for the Jews who travelled out of England. Uh, via the River Thames, where if it wasn't bad enough, these exiled Jews then had to pay a deportation tax to leave England. Um, the edict expulsion was ordered by the king, was not viewed by historians as a sudden decision, according to my notes here, but more than 200 years prior to this, the Jews were subject to increased persecution, had already started with the rumours of the blood libels and the pogroms in the 12th and the 13th century. Following the edict in 1290, the Jews were not allowed to live in England until the 1650s with Oliver Cromwell. Uh, in 1305, we see that the Jews of France were imprisoned on uh, Tish B'Av and then uh, expelled. And in 1492, we have King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella who expelled the Jews of Spain on this tragic date. Uh, but prior to that, um, it, uh, Spain was a, a place of uh, mercy. It was a place where the Jewish people actually flourished. Mm. And then, of course, we then had the, uh, the Spanish Inquisition, uh, uh, whereby many Jewish people living in Spain were actually fearful that they would be uh, uh, murdered by the state. So therefore, they converted to Catholicism. And then in the Spanish Inquisition, they were hounded out as being heretics for converting to, to Catholicism on the claim that they were practicing uh, their Jewish faith at home. So to bring and enlighten us uh, a lot more on the issue of Ninth of Av, uh, I was joined earlier today by um, Stephen Jaffe, who's the co-chair of Northern Ireland Friends of Israel, and a consultant to Magin David uh, Dom to get his perspective on the Ninth of Av. I mean, thank you for inviting me. And um, can you share with us the, the importance and the significance of the 9th of Av? And according to my notes here, this is Tisha 
be Av, that uh, the Jewish people like yourself and, uh, and Israel um, remembered the destruction of the first and second temples um, on Sunday. Yes, well, it was, uh, it was this Sunday this year, uh, Simon. Uh, it's a very, it's, it's an art day in, in, in many respects, and it always strikes me that it's coming in the height of summer, with sun shining, people are thinking in normal years anyway of, of holidays, and, and it's, uh, for most people, a, a light time of, of the year, of relaxation and, and holiday, whereas for the Jewish people, they're thrown back at uh, you know, the worst aspects of their history, you're quite right, it commemorates uh, the destruction of both temples in Jerusalem, which took place uh, in the month of Av in the, in the Jewish calendar. Uh, and the 9th of Av is there to commemorate the very tragic events that we can read about in the Bible, in the book of Jeremiah, which we read, the book of Lamentations, we read on the day, uh, and also in the, in, in the history of Josephus, who of course is talking about the Roman destruction of the second temple. So both the Babylonian destruction and uh, the Roman destruction, isn't it amazing that this people are remembering these events of 2,000 and two and a half thousand years ago, and yet we live in a world where there are people who very genuinely want to challenge the Jewish people's connection to Jerusalem. And here is this people, if they could only see us, fasting on the 9th of Av, commemorating these tragic events in Jerusalem, they would realize what they're up against, which is something very deeply spiritual. Uh, and Stephen, can you explain to us um, why the 9th of Av is so significant and so important to the Jewish people? Because it's extraordinary to think that, for example, the first uh, temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar that we read about in Isaiah, Jeremiah, the book of Daniel, um, and then we see the, the destruction of the second temple by the Romans in AD 70 occurred 600 years apart, but they fell on the same day, uh, the 9th of Ab. Correct. Uh, you know, some people out there believe in coincidences. Uh, it, it is an amazing fact uh, that uh, th these events occurred on, on the same date, it has to be said. Uh, the destruction of the temples was not just a, a kind of an uh, one-off incident it took place spread out uh i think the siege of jerusalem was was months in both cases by the babylonians and the romans in, indeed over a year so the, these were are long spread out we, we the, the fast of tisha B'av comes at the end of a three-week period of mourning uh which uh commemorates the breach of the walls of jerusalem so we're reliving the siege and yes, well, what is the significance of something that happened so long ago? Well, to be uh, clear about it, Simon, this is a, it, it is about an ongoing exile, both physically from the land of Israel and spiritually in the sense that we do not have a, a temple uh, to this very day. So it's very, very profound and deep uh, for the Jewish people around the world, wherever they were. My, I always tell people this, my wife's family came from Iraq, my family came, we're living in Poland and Lithuania for centuries, and yet what united them was both a remembrance of what had brought them to the, these countries in terms of Iraq, the Jewish community there dated its arrival in Iraq from the time of Nebuchadnezzar, two and a half thousand years ago, and yet the common shared memory of that trauma of, of destruction and exile, but also the hope that this would be at some point the Jewish people would return to Jerusalem, would return to the land, was what bound together my family living in Poland and Lithuania and Russia and my wife's family, Sarah's family, living in Iraq for centuries. It's beyond rational, reasonable, historical analysis. At the end of the day, you've got to say this is unprecedented, that this people should retain its memory. And of course, the, the fast of Tisha B'Av is, is central in how the Jewish people remembered these events from year to year, from generation to generation. Uh, I mean, Stephen, if, if we look back at some of the worst catastrophic moments in, in Jewish history, they all fall on the 9th of Av. For example, on the 9th of Av in 1190, the Jews of York were massacred. 100 years later, on 9th of Av, the Jews of England were, exp uh, were expelled. 
in 1305, the Jews of France were imprisoned on the 9th of Av. In uh, 1492, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella expelled the Jews from Spain on this tragic date. Uh, in 1571, the Jews of Florence forced into a ghetto. And in 1670, the Jews were forced out of Vienna. And also Germany declared war on Russia, putting the First World War into motion on on the 9th of Av, uh, 1914. Um, so it's extraordinary to think what has happened. Is this a warning to the Jewish people and a warning to the world? Well, I, uh, I, I take your point. I mean, just listening to that litany of, of, of tragedy, it is, of course, an indictment on the world because they are the persecuting force. And sadly, we see, we see in our world today people who would dearly like to bring a, a, another uh, Tisha B'Av on the Jewish people. Uh, that hasn't gone away, that urge to destroy the Jewish people's attachment to the land of Israel, its faith, it's in our world uh, today. So it is, it's to, just to listen to those events and, and just think about this recurring uh, tragedy for the Jewish people uh, it, it is, it's mind blowing. However, I, I bring us back to the point that it's also a day of hope because throughout our exile, throughout uh, those horrendous events that you've just listed, which by the way wasn't a comprehensive list of every tragedy that's befallen the Jewish people, uh, the Shoah, uh, obviously in, in the lifetime of some of the, of the viewers of this program. So the lesson to, to the world I think is, is one, uh, that anti-Semitism and Jew hatred is a constant throughout history, but let's not forget the second lesson is that the Jewish people survives, survives those catastrophic events which would have destroyed many other peoples. The exile from Spain was a massive tragedy for the Jewish people. This, Spain was a place where the Jewish community had been settled for centuries. Uh, there was a great flowering of Jewish culture in, in Spain and yet uh, completely destroyed overnight. So the two lessons, Jew hatred, a constant, and the survival of the Jewish people throughout are, I think, the major lessons. Also, what I think is extremely um, uh, significant, and there seems to be a direct correlation between the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem in AD 70 by the Romans, and then the Jewish people having to experience all of this all over again, as we mentioned, the expulsion of the Jews from England, in 1290, uh, the expulsion of the Jews from France in uh, 1492, the expulsion of the Jews from Russia with the pogroms, uh, and even the final solution, uh, the first day it was implemented, was also the 9th of Av um, in uh, July of uh, 1941. So we're, we're really approaching its 80th anniversary. Yeah. Um, and yet the Jewish people seem to, to have to relive these moments over again. Um, and is that is that a message to, to your people to say that the only place that the Jewish people are, are safe is back in their ancient covenant homeland, which is the modern state of Israel? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a game changer. Let's, let's put it that way. In terms of uh, the Jewish people's ability to defend itself, uh, that was revolutionized regarding... Uh, the establishment of the state of Israel for the first time, the Jewish people have its own government and its own army since uh, some of these events that we, we commemorate going right back to AD 70. Another event to add to the list is in the year 135, the Bar Kokhba revolt, the fort of uh, Betar, which was their last stronghold, is said to have fallen to the Romans on, on Tisha. So it takes us, the connection between the land of Israel and the Jewish people Yes, it is the, 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 the change. Uh, and, and Tisha B'Av, in all its sadness, in all its warning, by the way, the warning to the world is, you know, many of those places that you've mentioned, Spain, uh, a world leading country uh, collapses after the expulsion of the Jews, becomes very secondary in terms of world history. Russia, uh, the decline there, I mean, Again and again, it's the nations that come against the Jews that end up having the, the, the long consequence of that. So, so it's a, a warning both to the Jewish people and to the nations of the world. 
And um, Stephen, the one I think uh, hope that we can draw from this is, is the fact that we can see the mercy of God in action. So we've mentioned the Spanish Inquisition, which was absolutely horrific, and the expulsion of the Jewish people from Spain in uh, 1492. But what is so interesting is that the day after the Ninth of Av, the day that the Jewish people were kicked out of Spain, um, God raised up uh, Christopher Columbus uh, to discover the New Worlds and discovered uh, the United States of America, uh, South America as well, and that the United States became the biggest safe haven for the Jewish people outside of Israel in world history. Doesn't this really show us the incredible mercy of God? Five to six million Jews living in the United States, yes, many of them coming as refugees from that uh, Tsarist persecution in the late 19th century. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and in our own day, uh, the state of Israel is established within years, you know, a few years of Auschwitz, uh, murdering Jews by the thousand by the day. It is only a three year gap between that and the establishment of the state of Israel. So let us draw that hope both from the Middle Ages, as you say, the Columbus is, he didn't go out to, to discover America, of course. Uh, he thought he was going to India, but that is uh, an amazing, as you say, again, let the historians call it a coincidence, that on the very day afterwards, uh, the solution to the, to the terrible catastrophe, uh, God is already setting in motion. So I think that, that it is quite a remarkable thing. Uh, and, and finally, Stephen, have you got a message for our viewers um, about the spiritual significance of the Ninth of Av uh, to Christians, but also to our society at large that, that ignore the dangers of Jew hatred at their peril? Well, I would say to the, to the viewers of the programme, if you want to know more, just read the Book of Lamentations. And, and it's a, such a short but powerful uh, message there of uh, Jerusalem's fall. So... I know that the viewers of this program will understand that the lessons of, of Tisha B'Av in terms of where Jew hatred ultimately takes you, and it's a spiritual rebellion against God, against his Hebrew scriptures, and I know what side of that battle your viewers want to, want to be on, and I would say, to refresh your memory, read the book of Jeremiah, it certainly will, uh, I think, be very impactful. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us on Behind Headlines, especially on this extremely hot day, and um, very much appreciate the work that you do, and it's always a pleasure to have you on the Revelation TV platform. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you. Pleasure. I'm very thankful for that interview there, Simon. Um, here we have... Uh, from Carmen, I've never heard of the 9th of Av. Thanks for educating us. Um, Barbara says, hi, Simon and Reagan. This is an incredible and informative program. I confess I had no knowledge of the significance of such a date in Israel's history. And so it is um, this Sunday coming or last? It's the last. last. It's the last. Um, it started on Saturday evening and was completed on Sunday evening. Uh, in our calendar. I'm thinking this would be a good and important topic for my home group. Uh, by all means, you know, we're, we're picking this up uh, a couple of days after the fact. Um, it would definitely be something good to talk about. And um, tragically, Simon, the significance of it is, um, I, th I think, often overlooked and, and lost on uh, many in evangelical circles. Uh, absolutely. And if the viewer wants my program notes, just email the office um, and I'll be happy to send you my program notes with all these dates and stuff as well on them. Um, I'm also, I mean, if we bring up to date, so let's see that uh, Tish Ba'av in uh, 1571, the Jews of Florence were forced into ghettos. This is where we see the first uh, ghettoization of, of the Jewish people. And then in 1670, the Jews were forced out of Vienna in Austria. Uh, we saw the Russian uh, programs um, also started on the 9th of Av in 1881 and uh, to 1884 uh, against the Jewish people. But also you might not know uh, is that the First World War started on the 1st of August when uh, Germany declared war on Russia, uh, which then triggered the, uh, the First World War. And then we also see that the end of the First World War brought a rise of anti-Semitism in both Germany and Russia, during the Russian Revolution of 1970 uh, beyond, and then we saw the movements of fascism and Nazism, 
and at the heart of this ideology was was Jew hatred. Uh, and then we also see, if we go and look into the Second World War, that on the second of August, um, the of uh, second of August, nineteen forty one. Uh, Hitler implemented uh, what was known as the final solution. On the, that was implemented on the 9th of Av that would result in the destruction of half of Europe's European Jewry, its population, but also over 6 million Jewish people in the gas chambers and the Nazi death camps and the firing squads. Uh, we also see then on the 23rd of July, and again, the 9th of Av, 1942, the Treblinka death camp, uh, which was in a forest in the northeast of Warsaw, uh, began its operations as a death camp and continued operating until October uh, 1943. The Hebrew date of that operation began at the death camp was Tish B'Av. On the exact day, the first deportations from Warsaw ghetto to Treblinka began again the ninth, uh, the ninth of Av. It's incredible how many uh, were slaughtered. There are eight hundred and seventy thousand Jews within fifteen months. Um, just the death toll is um, immense. Uh, one point one million people were murdered in Auschwitz-Birkenau between nineteen forty and nineteen forty-five. It took just more uh, than a year to murder close to one million Jews at, at Treblinka, along with several thousand Romanis. Um, the Germans demanded that the Juden organize the deportation list. The head of the Jewish Council in the Warsaw Ghetto um, was Adam Cherniakov. Uh, he refused to give lists of names or help the Nazis with organizing the deportation list. And so on July 23rd, 1942, Cherniakov committed suicide by swallowing a cyanide capsule because he would rather die than assist the Nazis in the slaughter of the Jews. Now, um, th that's all um, fairly significant stuff from the last century, but even in recent times, we've seen some very key events on the 9th of, of tragic events. 1994, there was a deadly bombing, um, the building of the AMIA, the Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires, Argentina. 86 people were killed and some 300 wounded. Uh, then, of course, there was in, in 2006, you already mentioned Israel's war with Hezbollah in Lebanon. And you uh, looked up, which I didn't know, the disengagement from Gaza in 2005, right. in which Israel pulled 12,000 or more Jewish settlers living in Gaza out of their homes. Um, and also the uh, possible war in 2014. I'm not sure on that one. But I just also, to bring you up to date as well, uh, this, was, this happened over the weekend that uh, the weekend... Uh, fell on the 9th of Ant on Sunday. And on this difficult day, Israel's health minister, Nitzan Horovitch, uh, announced, of course, it's possible that there will be another lockdown. Everyone can understand that if there's a huge outbreak here, including serious morbidity, uh, Horovitch made a statement uh, right after 430 new cases of coronavirus were reported on Shabbat, the day before Tish B'Av. Uh, with 1,118 cases present in the entire country. As of that morning, 63 patients were in a serious condition. Uh, four weeks ago, there were only 19 serious con uh, conditions of uh, coronavirus uh, in Israel, and some are predicting that they could see 1,000 serious cases by August. Most Israeli experts have noted that the healthcare can only handle between 700 and 800 serious COVID-19 cases uh, harming the uh, uh, Israel's health care system. But also we see as well that uh, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett also warned that Israel could go into a third lockdown. And he announced this on uh, the 9th of Av. Now, bringing up to date and uh, linking it to kind of Bible prophecy, if we follow the course of uh, patterns, uh, um, uh, as we've explored historically and biblically through the 9th of Av, I think one thing comes to mind that you could actually say uh, and I would say this is just a suggestion, this is just a comment, but it kind of fits um, that what we could see is that when the Antichrist emerges and signs the peace treaty with Israel, which is that seven-year peace treaty covenant, that is the tribulation period. Does this actually happen on the 9th of Av? And when the Antichrist breaks that peace treaty halfway through the tribulation period, that three-and-a-half-year period, again, would that fall on the 9th of Av? And uh, also we know that uh, Armageddon, when the nations of the world are, are surrounded, 
to destroy Jerusalem, and they're poised to do so, and Yeshua returns. Does that happen on the 9th of Av? I think if you follow the, the, the correlation between the biblical and historical events, it's definitely a possibility. Uh, there's no way we can say that this is absolute certain because mm. uh, I don't know about you, but I don't plan to be here during that time. Right. So, so, um, <laughs> so, so Simon, um, one of the things, of course, we, uh, we know that um, no one knows the day or time or hour of his coming. We, we know that no one um, can fully and dogmatically say, yeah, definitely it's going, uh, these events are going to happen at this particular time. But you're onto something there. We see a, there is a clear pattern throughout um, history. It's inarguable that in God's plan and purpose, he has given us these signposts, uh, d days of great catastrophe, days of mourning that um, I, th I think call um, his, his chosen people, Israel, to say, um, look to me, come, come to me. The, the law that you quoted there um, uh, in Leviticus and in the Torah and then also in Deuteronomy um, it says, you know, if, if you wander away from me, if you wander away from my path, um, there are going to be consequences. And um, to me, I think that this is very much, um, these are days of mourning which serve as tragic reminders that, that really I, I pray that um, our Jewish friends and anyone who may be viewing this will say, well, could it be that Messiah has already come? Because Daniel, we quoted Daniel, Haggai, and they showed very clearly that the Messiah would come before the second temple was destroyed. But I also think in God, in his love and mercy, mm. doesn't want Israel to enter into this false peace with the exactly. Antichrist, who right. promises that he will protect Israel, that then triggers the tribulation period. Obviously, I believe before then is the pre-trib rapture where the church, true church is taken uh, in the air to meet the Lord in, in the sky. Then we see uh, a period of chaos and then the Antichrist emerges as a one world leader and a one world government, makes a pact with Israel for seven years. And I think possibly that could actually fall on the 9th of Av as a warning to the Jewish people of the destruction that's going to fall upon them. Uh, when the world is run by the Antichrist and the, uh, the third temple is built in Jerusalem. Um, so, I mean, I think mm. actually the 9th of Av does fit in, I believe, into end times Bible prophecy. Uh, we've seen how God has used this particular day to accomplish his purpose in the past. There's no um, reason to think that he won't continue to do that. Um, for, for whatever reason, as part of his sovereignty, as one of our viewers has said, um, this day is key. It's um, a day where God has chosen to work in power and um, he will continue to do so. And our, our prayer is that he will, um, even as there's that symbolic cleansing of the floors as people wait um, to, to symbolize they're awaiting the Messiah's redemption, our desire is to see our um, Jewish family and friends see the redemption. The Redeemer has come. There is a Redeemer. His name is Yeshua HaMashiach, and, and he's coming again. Amen. Uh, Reagan, great to join you on Behind the Headlines, um, despite the hot temperatures, and it's great that uh, you can join us for today's program. There is no doubt whatsoever that the 9th of Av is incredibly significant, not only biblically significant, but historically significant. And it, what it proves is that history is his story. He has a plan and a purpose and a redemption for Israel and the Jewish people. That's why they need our love and support. So thank you for watching tonight's Behind the Headlines.